So, hello and welcome uh, to this uh, session, which will be about athletes. Um, I've talked about the Sports Governance Observer maybe already too many times. Um, I would just advise you that if you want to learn more about it, just go and get it. Um, there are a lot of people asking me, where can we get it? Well, you have a voucher in your conference package. You can just go to the information desk. So take the voucher to the desk and then you get it. Okay, so let's talk about athletes. Athletes, I think, are difficult. It's a difficult subject for a number of reasons. There has not been too many research on the position of athletes in international sports governance. And the position of athletes has always been rather difficult in international sports governance, particularly. So I'm very happy that uh, we were able to welcome Sir Brendan Schwab, head of Uni World Athletes, to help us and certainly help me to understand this issue better uh, because I did not have too much research to rely on. So I'm here to get your input, but also your input. Uh, I'm not here to lecture you about athletes, I'm here to learn uh, from you. So I'm very happy if this can end up in a lively discussion and a debate on the role of athletes. Just to give you an introduction to show you why the position of athletes is difficult in international sports governance. And to understand this, we have to go back to the origins of organized sports. What happened in the 1800s? People were coming together, they were starting to practice sports together. Because they had fun doing so, they established clubs. Clubs that allowed them to compete against each other. Of course, what do you have when you what you need when you have clubs, and you really want to organize competition, then you need uh, consistent and clear rules. This is why, from clubs, national sports associations emerged. Yeah, so you have athletes, you have clubs, clubs creating national sports federations, and then we saw that increasingly the International sport was taking international sports competition was increasingly taking place at an international level. Yeah, countries were starting to compete against each other. What do you need then when you want to organize a real and good international competition? Again, you need clear and consistent rules. So, therefore, out of national sports federations, international sports federations emerged to organize uh, international competition. Now, as sports commercialized and became more complex, these international federations were taking up an increasing number of tasks. And increasingly, they've had uh, a more important impact on uh, athletes. At the same time, of course, you see here that athletes are put in a very difficult position. And you see that this system actually, which emerged very logically, one would say, is in fact inherently undemocratic. Why is that? Well, because in principle, of course, when you look at this system, you have an international federation increasingly having a strong impact on athletes' professions and athletes' lives. But athletes, if they want to influence the, the International Federation, they have to go via clubs, their clubs. Then they have to rely on their clubs to voice their grievances to their national sports federations. And then they have to rely on the fact that national sports federations voice their grievances to international sports federations. This is, of course, very difficult. So that each link of this chain, you will see that there will be some distortion, imperfect control. Yeah? Also, clubs have different interests than athletes in many aspects. National sports federations may have different interests. Even international sports federations may have different interests. So you can see that this system, how international sports governance emerged, really put athletes behind. 
And there is one thing I want to stress about these slides uh, even more, is that if you look at this, athletes are the ultimate principles. What do I mean by ultimate principles? Well, this whole system of international sports governance, of sports governance, emerged from their need to compete. They are the ultimate principles. And yet we see that increasingly uh, international sports federations are conducting tasks on their behalf without athletes being able to influence international sports governance. So problematical system. Now, let's be fair towards international sports federations. They have realized that this is problematical. And what have they done? Well, uh, 34 international sports federations, that's the large majority, so because it's up to 35, they have given athletes representative, uh, athlete representatives consultative status in their organizational structures, meaning that they have, a, for instance, an athletes com commission or athletes committee in place. That's good, we would say. Yeah, that's, that's definitely positive. However, if we want to make sure that athletes have a real impact, representatives should have access to decision making. Otherwise, uh, you will never be able to influence the rules that govern your own activity. And also, second point, there must be a clear connection between uh, representatives, so the ones that are representing the athletes at the international level, uh, and the athletes themselves. And this can be achieved, I would say, uh, most easily by uh, having athletes, um, representatives, uh, that is, elected by their peers. So at least representatives representing athletes at international sports federations, I think, should be elected by athletes. And they should have access to decision-making power. That's a theory. What do we see in practice? You can read about this in the Sport Governance Observer. The majority of federations, 23 federations, that's 66%, um, in these federations, the chairman of the chairwoman of the Athletes Commission is a member of the decision-making body. So, in principle, this person has access to decision-making. However, in only eight federations, athletes elect the chairman or chairwoman of the Athletes Commission. Yeah? So, a representative with access to decision-making power, only in eight federations, there is a strong link with athletes. In eight other federations, uh, the chairman and chairwoman of the Athletes Commission is elected by the Congress, so by the national federations, not by athletes. But the athletes' representative should be, um, should be elected, I think, by athletes because he or she should be answerable to the athletes, not the national federations. Yes, and this, uh, this is how we measure um, athletes' representation um, by using a sports government observer. These are, uh, this is the methodological cheat sheet. And I just wanted to show you this because I need input. I need to know what is the best way for athletes to be represented at uh, an international sports federation. What is the best way to make sure that athletes are decently represented, that they can have their say, that they can have influence. For the moment, um, we chose, uh, you can see it in the state of the art indicator, we say that athletes should be represented within a specific athletes committee, then the chairman or chairwoman uh, should be a member of the organization's governing body, yeah, so the executive committee, and then the chairman and chairwoman should be elected by athletes. Uh, and I want to stress that this is a starting point. I thought, okay, if organizations have this in place already, that's a good starting point. I also told you that Sports Governance Observer is uh, an ongoing process. We will develop this further, so these indicators, they are bound to change. We will have to improve them, we need to change them. So my question to you is, how can we improve it? Yeah, does this suffice as a state-of-the-art uh, category? So. I have lots of questions. I don't have that many answers, to be honest. 
My questions are primarily directed at this course. First one, how should the position of athletes be improved? How can athletes contribute to good governance? What is the importance of collective bargaining agreements? We did not speak about this in a sports governance observer, but I know that this is important. Um, how are athletes going to be represented at the national level? We don't know that. We've only looked at into the international level. And how can we improve athletes' unions? And maybe one more provocative question can be, do we need international sports federations to regulate uh, the profession of athletes? If you take a look at the situation in North America, there you see that collective bargaining agreements between employers and employees, owners of sports clubs and athletes, they regulate uh, the employment relations of athletes. Some athletes have a very direct say into the rules that govern their own activities. Should we strive towards a uh, situation such, such as that? So, should we uh, go to a lesser role for international sports federations? Many, many questions. I'm sorry that I do not have the answer, but I hope that we will get some um, answers from our speaker, uh, and that is Mr. Ben Schwab, again, from Uni Global Athletes. Thank you. five or six questions that you ask at the end, I think, uh, are ones we can certainly come back to. And I'd be happy to uh, have everyone in the, uh, in, 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 uh, the meeting um, speak to them. Uh, thank you very much uh, on behalf of Uni World Athletes, um, the global voice of the world professional athletes, for the opportunity to speak to today's conference on the critical subject of the governance of sport, and, and in particular, the role of the athletes in uh, delivering good governance. You may not have heard of Uni World Athletes because we're only a new organisation. We were established in December 2014, officially, after a three-year process of close collaboration. The affiliated organisations that make up Uni World Athletes are FIFPRO, the World Footballers Association, the International Rugby Players Association, the Federation of International Cricketers Associations, EU Athletes, the US, Basketball Players Association, the National Football League Players Association of the United States, the National Hockey League Players Association of the United States and Canada, the Japanese Baseball Players Association, uh, and indeed the Australian Athletes Alliance, which is a peak body for all the major player unions. Together, those organisations bring together some 85,000 professional athletes more than 100 independent player associations who are located in over 60 countries. They have a vital role to play, not only advancing the interests of their members, but also shaping the direction of their sports. If one looks at the priority that governance is being given in the world today, a case can be made that it's the most important issue that confronts the administration of professional sports and therefore those that play sport for a living. I approach today's discussion from two perspectives. First, as a lawyer at a player association, official with some 20 years experience, mostly at the global level. And secondly, as a sports administrator from Australia, a nation which points to key governance reforms in all of its major professional sports as having been fundamental to the development of those sports on the field of play, commercially, professionally and at grassroots level. I know that governance reform is hard and that it faces the staunchest of resistance and critics. For example, the reform of Australian soccer a decade ago required the closing down of the National Federation. And we heard that suggested for FIFA today. It involved the closing down of the professional league and the relocation of our federation from the Oceania Confederation to Asia. We turned a $9 million business into a $200 million business in less than 10 years. As the player union leader involved in that transformation, the players adopted the philosophical position that the well-being of the game was a precondition to the well-being of the players. Accordingly, the players were obliged to fundamentally shape the governance and decision-making of the game for the better. For if they did not, the players would pay an unacceptable price in terms of their own careers and livelihoods. 
That philosophical position seems equally relevant to many sports at the global level today. Plainly, athletes have a stake in and role to play in the deliverance of good governance in sport. The livelihoods and careers of athletes are fundamentally impacted by poor governance due to the non-payment of salaries, the unjust termination of player contracts, abuses such as third party ownership, and threats such as racism, victimisation, bullying, harassment, cheating and corruption. All of these problems are acutely felt by athletes who are young, often minors, and pursuing a career which is intensely competitive, short term and precarious. Also, athletes play a fundamental role in the generation of sports wealth. Of FIFA's revenue of 5.72 billion US dollars for the 2011 to 2014 cycle, 4.83 billion was generated from the 2014 FIFA World Cup in Brazil, a tournament that involved 64 matches and 736 players. Prize money to the country's total $354 million, about 7% of the revenue, and my knowledge of the collective agreements in that in place suggest that the player's share of that wealth would be lucky to be 2%. Research also undertaken by Thief Pro Stone Fix It campaign and the player questionnaire shows that players place great importance in their own sense of integrity as well as their duties to their families, teammates and sport. Yet most approaches by governing bodies to protecting the integrity of sport see athletes as the problem and not the solution. It seems obvious that sport will only be well governed if it's run in partnership with the players, for the players represent a fundamental stakeholder that necessarily has to take an objective, long-term and well-informed view of their industry. They are professionally and emotionally engaged with their sport, they're involved at all levels of the game, and in all parts of the world, and they've come through development systems. They work for clubs and countries of all sizes and in all parts of the globe. They are dedicated to the generation of players that follow. However, any partnership with the players is only possible if the governance of sporting bodies is accountable to the players, as well as other key st stakeholders. And the notion of accountability, I will come to a lot in this uh, presentation. So what's the starting point for reforming the governance of sport? The effectiveness of any reform effort requires it to address the causes of the governance failures. For too long, the significance society places on sport has been misused by major sporting bodies to justify privilege instead of duty. Vague notions such as the specificity or the autonomy of sport, which have been adopted at the highest levels of government, including in the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union and by the General Assembly of the United Nations, have been emphasised unconditionally. However, the autonomy of sport, as first developed as a notion within the European institutions, is highly conditional. It demands good governance, social dialogue, and the protection and development of young people, especially through education. Further, it does not affect sport where it is an economic activity. For the necessary governance to reforms, a broad societal acknowledgement is required that as sports are structured as cartels, they warrant not special treatment and protection, but enhanced scrutiny and accountability. As a stakeholder whose livelihoods are fundamentally affected by the current structure, the world's athletes have organised themselves globally through their major player associations to help finally deliver the good governance in sport. FIFA, of course, is the topic of a lot of our attention, and FIFA Pro is the biggest affiliate of uh, Uni World Athletes, and I hold office as a Vice President of FIFA Pro and as Chairman of Division Asia. It was very noteworthy that when uh, the now suspended FIFA President, Seth Blatter, announced his surprise resignation on the 2nd of June, he uttered the following words when laying down his mandate. While I have a mandate from the membership of FIFA, I do not feel that I have a mandate from the entire world of football. The fans, the players, the clubs, the people who live, breathe and love football. Now if we look at the long-standing failure of FIFA's own reform efforts to reform its governance, we need to ask ourselves whether the current process is likely to be successful. 
As we know, a couple of years ago, the recommendations of the Independent Governance Committee chaired by Professor Mark Peeth of the Basel Institute on Governance and made up of critical stakeholders, including FIFRO, our president of the time, Leonardo Grosso, have been largely ignored. But the lessons from that report, which is dated the 22nd of April 2014, remain relevant. These are the roles played by the six FIFA confederations in defeating the principal reforms. The uncertainty that continues to surround the awarding of the hosting rights for the 2018 and 2022 World Cups and how the reform process is to be driven if it is to succeed. The current reform process being chaired by Dr. Francois Carrard consists of representatives of the six FIFA confederations. Not surprisingly, the role of the confederations and the member associations in the structure of FIFA was not raised as a fundamental matter in the preliminary recommendations of his so-called reform committee, which were issued only last week. Indeed, the committee recommends still that elections of FIFA's governing body continue to be determined by the member associations and conducted within the confederations. Now, I mentioned earlier that I also approached this as a, from my experience in Australia, um, where I was the Secretary General of the Australian Athletes Alliance for a number of years and ran uh, the Professional Footballers Association there for many years. Australia is certainly not complacent when it comes to governance reform. In recent years, the Australian Rugby Union reformed its governance structure. The Australian Rugby League fundamentally overhauled its structure. Cricket's governance was reformed in 2011, and I'll come back to that because it specifically addresses the question of the role of the players. Football Federation Australia had two re uh, recent governance reforms. The entire sports industry reviewed its structure. And the only sport which has not reviewed its structure in the last few years is the Australian Football League, which is regarded as Australia's largest professional sport, but having a white, and is also widely regarded as having, quote, a best governance, a best practice, I beg your pardon, governance model. The AFL's not reviewed its governance since a famous review of its corporate governance structure in August 1992. Now that review was delivered by a gentleman named David Crawford, who I will come back to in uh, this brief presentation. The 1992 review was delivered at a time when the AFL was struggling. Now if you want to know what the AFL is like, think about the NFL in the United States and then apply it to Australia. That's probably the easiest way to deal with it. The, the nation is obsessed with it and it's a multi-billion dollar business. Um, the AFL, which was then the Victorian Football League, was struggling to come to terms with a plan to develop into a national competition. And Mr Crawford was engaged at the behest of disgruntled clubs to review the governance and structure of Australian football. Even though he was responding to that disconnect, uh, discontent by the stakeholders, he recommended a second wave of reform, or a further wave of reform, and handled all major decision-making power to an independent AFL commission. He recommended the clear demarcation between the responsibility of the board and management and clear accountability to the owners, who he said were the clubs, who retained veto rights only over major decisions that changed the game, such as to expand or contract the number of teams. So when one examines what is good governance, the role of the athlete, which is our specific topic today, has yet to be fully embraced, although it would be wrong to say it's not been considered. <coughs> Mr Crawford reflected on the principles of good governance in his 2011 report on a good governance structure for Australian cricket. And his report reads as follows. We believe that cricket's interests will be best served by adopting the governance structure now regarded as the best throughout the world. This is an independent and well-skilled board that is clearly accountable to the owners and which doesn't confuse its role with that of management. In many of our meetings, this was described as the AFL model, but this is a misunderstanding. 20 years ago, the AFL simply adopted what, what is now seen as the best governance model, which is the same design as that of BHP Billiton or a major not-for-profit company like Mission Australia. These boards are designed as far as possible to remove conflicts of interest and attract relevant skills. The board's main role is to agree strategy and appoint and oversee highly competent management 
on behalf of the owners. The owners appoint the board as their representatives and are able to dismiss the board if necessary. A good board will be comprised of directors who understand that their primary duty is to act on behalf of all owners in the game as a whole and not sectional interests. A good board will be of workable size and its members will be chosen for their complementary skills and capacity to contribute. A good board understands that its role is different to that of management. The board's delegations to management will be clear and those major decisions that retain by the board will also be clear. Similarly, the board's accountability to the owners will be understood and those few matters that must be referred to the owners for approval will be clearly defined. So this raises the obvious and fundamental question, who are the owners? Who are the stakeholders? Who are the shareholders? And an effective governance structure will clearly define to whom the board is accountable, how that accountability will be exercised. Put another way, it is to agree who can dismiss the board. Unless a board can be removed, it will lack the necessary accountability. And that I think is a key issue where we're falling down in the discussion. We're talking about term limits, we're talking about contested elections, but who among the stakeholders can remove the board or board members when performance isn't what it should be? Now in the cricket case, Australian cricket and internationally cricket has as many problems with its governance as football because these principles are not being applied. The common view in Australian cricket was that the cricket associations in the various states were the shareholders and David Crawford agreed with that. He described them as the custodians of the game on behalf of the wider community. And so the rights of the owners were essentially defined as being three. The right to move, appoint the board, the right to dismiss a director or the whole board, and approval, thirdly, of those very important decisions that fundamentally change the business, such as to add or delete teams or major competitions. The vesting of these rights in the owners is what delivers accountability. So, who are the rightful owners of international sporting federations? Given the role of the players in the generation of FIFA's wealth, for example, as well as in the promotion and the development of the game, it seems that the players have a significant claim to ownership. This is particularly so given they, unlike the clubs and the leagues, and as Anna just pointed out, do not have a dominant position within the governance of the national football associations. Indeed, the Sports Governance Observer that we've heard so much about states that, quote, athletes are put in a complicated position regarding control. Even though ISFs or International Sporting Federations are increasingly regulating the profession of athletes, athletes seem to lack direct control options. Now, Mr Crawford, in his review into Australian cricket, looks specifically at the question of whether owners include the players. In our interviews, we asked several times whether professional players should be regarded as a shareholder, <coughs> their report reads. Their stake in the game is obvious and also different to that of the many amateur players. Our view, though, is that this is not preferable. Players will want their share of cricket's revenue and will need to negotiate this share along the game development pro uh, profit priorities, the fans, such as admittance prices, keeping them down, and the need for facilities. As co-owners with a position on the board, they would have an uncomfortable conflict of interest. Their long-term position is best served working in partnership with Cricket Australia than being viewed as a co-owner along with the state associations. So that's the expert view coming out of Australia. Now I think we can contest that because the issue of the distribution of revenue is an issue that affects all stakeholders. Certainly not an issue that is uh, dominating uh, FIFA's executive committee meetings with less than 2% of the revenue of uh, generated by players uh, being returned to them. But of course, uh, the issue of the distribution of revenue affects the clubs, it affects the member associations. Um, but I don't think that alone would justify <coughs> excluding the players from ownership. But Mr Crawford does call for the sport of cricket to be run in partnership with the players. Like all owners, the players would continue to have a vested interest in the maximisation of revenue for the benefit of all, an essential component of any partnership, and will be dedicated to on-field success as well as the continued growth and development of the game. Indeed, the key challenges facing the integrity of sport 
match fixing, doping, financial sustainability, require the engagement and commitment of the athletes in order to be effectively addressed. In the words of leading United States Attorney Jeffrey Kessler, who has extensive experience representing the NFL and the NBA Players Associations, he says as follows, what history has taught us is there's no inconsistency between having a fair system for players and having a healthy sport. Quite the contrary, what we've seen is that when sports have given players more freedom and have compensated them better, the entire sport has grown on the revenue side. The players and the clubs can work together to build the sport much more easily in a fair system than in an unfair system. It seems that an effective integrity program at a minimum requires the athletes to agree to regulations, undertake education, compromise on important legal rights such as privacy, and most importantly, to have trust in the process. Reporting approaches to fix games and undertaking testing for drugs can only occur if the athletes have trust and confidence in the established measures that will safeguard their security, health and privacy. Financially, athletes agree to labour market restraints that arguably indeed probably violate their legal rights. Yet most sports exclude the athletes from the strategic decision-making processes required to maximise revenue for the benefit of all stakeholders, including the players. What incentive is there for a sporting body, especially one with the power of an international sporting federation, to work in partnership with the players if it lacks any political accountability to them. Unfortunately, some sporting bodies seem to go out of their way to reject the role of player representatives, despite the long history of player associations acting responsibly and being key partners in addressing some sports' most fundamental challenges. Now, the response of WADA to the initial moves to establish Uni World Athletes is a case in point. The minutes of the Wider Foundation Board read that when it was drawn to their attention that this Global Athletes Association was being established, the chairman of the time, Mr John Fay, says as follows, giving such associations credibility and recognition would only encourage them to develop into a more prominent position than he believed they should, and in no way saw their role as being representative of sportsmen and women, and that he has urged all members not to give them any oxygen. Yet these are player associations which are democratically elected by players for players. As a consequence of this attitude, athletes are again resorting to the law and industrial action to install much needed accountability into the governance of sport and to make it clear that sport is not above the rule of law and that the voice and interests of athletes must be heeded. The current landmark proceedings involving German speed skater Claudia Peckstein and the Court of Arbitration for Sport, or CAS, together with the recent complaints to the European Commission by Dutch ice skaters or speed skaters Mark Chilter and Niels uh, Kirschholt, which are cases uh, supported by EU athletes, and FIFPRO's own complaint to the European Commission over football's player transfer system, suggest a re-emerging tendency on the part of athletes to reinstall the law as a central player in the good governance of sport. Women professional footballers have recently been on strike in Australia and Italy to achieve better paying conditions, and US players led a class action with players from all around the world in Canada last year over FIFA's decision to play the 2015 FIFA Women's World Cup on artificial pitches, a condition that would never be imposed on the men. IOC Vice President of Australia's John Coates, who is president of both the CAS and the International Council for Arbitration for Sport, the body responsible for financing and administering the CAS, has moved quickly to involve athlete commissions, which aren't raised, in some minor changes to the CAS in response to Claudia Pechstein's case. Nevertheless, in our view, this will not introduce the necessary levels of accountability. The Charter of the Athletes Commission of the Australian Olympic Committee, for example, the AOC, provides that the Commission's role is, quote, to advise the executive of the AOC. And it actually obliges each member of the Athletes Commission not to act in the best interest of the athletes or even the sport, but, quote, solely in the best interests of the AOC and its members as a whole. 
Now in contrast, let's have a look at what occurs when a major strategic partnership with the players is embraced as recommended by Mr Crawford in his review of Australian cricket. In the midst of the two major industrial lockouts in the National Football League and the National Basketball Association a couple of years ago, Major League Baseball and the Major League Baseball Players Association signed a new collective bargaining agreement through to 2016. That agreement guaranteed 21 years of labour peace in a sport which has the history of the most bitter and acrimonious player relations affected by industrial action by both sides. On 26th of November 2011, John Pesser, writing in the New York Times, commented on how three key players in American baseball, the former MLB Commissioner Bud Seeley, the former MLB Players Association Executive Director Don Fear, who is now the President of the New World Athletes, and New York Yankees owner, the late George Steinbrenner, forged these two decades of labour peace. Just how far did this partnership propel baseball? Consider these two elements in baseball's newest agreement. Pesser writes, one calls for the realignment of the game into two 15-team leagues, an idea first put on the table by the Players Association 10 years ago. Not only did management adopt an idea developed by the players, it gave the union the credit it deserved. God is the acrimony that held the game back for so long. On the issue of the luxury tax and revenue sharing, which holds down the payroll of even the Yankees, but rewards and encourages the smaller clubs to increase revenues and their payroll by fielding better teams, quote, the union got what it wanted and management <coughs> got what it wanted on the same issue. Now, if we look at the gaps between the rich and poor in football and the need for greater distribution of revenue and the increasing of the competitiveness of small teams in football, then this shows that the, the, the economic transformation that can be addressed through collective bargaining. In 2014, the benefits of baseball's partnership were revealed in the critical area of integrity with a collectively bargained anti-doping regime. In the words of the late Mike Weiner, the former executive director of the MLBPA, the players are determined to do all they can to continually improve sport, sports, the sports joint drug agreement. Players want a program that is tough, scientifically accurate, backed by the latest proven scientific methods and fair. I believe these changes formally support the players' desires while protecting their legal rights. Now, the view of the Union World Athletes and our affiliates when it comes to the WADA code is it's none of that. It's unfair, but most importantly, it's ineffective. Why should not athletes therefore have the right to collectively bargain those matters if we're going to get a better program that achieves the objectives which both sides of the table apparently share, and that is drug-free sport. So with the establishment of Uni World Athletes and the development of the um, player association movement throughout the world and across the sport, the opportunity exists for sport through its international federation to work in partnership with the athletes to install good governance and address many of the fundamental challenges sport faces today. However, that partnership must be underpinned by genuine accountability to the athletes. The requisite level of accountability can only be achieved if the athletes, through their associations and not the commissions, for the reasons I've mentioned, are recognised as critical stakeholders within the governance of sporting bodies, and that good governance, social dialogue and respect for the rule of law become the principal means by which any notion of the autonomy of sports can be recognised. And what I've done there um, on the slide, just by way of some conclusion, is to summarise uh, the key points by which we can uh, have a discussion about the role of the athletes in the delivery of the, uh, of the good governance of sport. I might just also make one point in, in, in closing and opening up the floor. I've covered a lot of history um, in that, in that uh, presentation of you know, 15 or 20 minutes. Athletes in that time have had to make a stand. Sports are a cartel. Um, famous cases like Kurt Flood's case in baseball, or John Mark Bosman's case in football, or George Eastman's case. These cases took a huge personal toll on the athletes concerned. I've met with Claudia Peckstein, who is now involved in this case in the Court of Arbitration for Sport. The principles at stake there are about the compulsory nature, the misuse of market position, and the fact that athletes don't have an equal say 
in the appointment of the arbitrator in accordance with the international arbitration law. The personal toll of that case on her is massive. It takes extraordinary courage and effort to take on an international sporting federation. And the only way that can be done in a way which is balanced is through the international player associations. And when it comes to the economic matters, and when I refer to the uh, situation, say, of baseball, the economic sophistication that was required to design revenue sharing formulas, the luxury tax, and these types of devices so that the game would grow was huge. To suggest that that type of sophistication can be brought to the table, absent, highly independent, well-resourced player association, <coughs> but through having one or two individuals appointed to a committee, I think is very, very naive. The challenges that sport face are very complex, as we've touched upon, and the player associations uh, now stand as a well-resourced, independent group of long-term thinkers who are absolutely dedicated to advancing sport because they know that that is the best way in which they can protect and advance the interests of their members. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brendan. Um, I think that we can all agree, if not we say so, that um, Athlete involvement in the governance of international sport is important. Um, and non international sports federations should demonstrate higher degrees of accountability towards athletes. And the question is, of course, how do we achieve this best? Um, you made a strong case for the involvement of uh, athletes' unions. Uh, is this the best way to go forward? It certainly gives athletes a stronger voice, I think. Uh, I think there are many questions that, um, that can be raised from uh, this great presentation. So uh, I would not take any more uh, of your time now, and I just want to open uh, the floor for questions. Uh, thank you, Gerard Sweeney from Transparency International. It's nice to see you both. Um, I, I, my first question would be to Arno, um, and then on to Brendan. Um, just in relation to the sports governance observer, I haven't had an opportunity to, to look yeah. very closely yet. Did you disaggregate the, when you said that 23 federations or so allow for athletes' participation in decision making? Mm -hmm. Is that, are those commissions that relate specifically or only to the welfare of athletes? Or, are you talking also about at more at the board or executive committee level where they have a role in decision making across yeah. sports as a whole? And then following on to that with Brendan, um, I mean our advocacy now relates very much to reform of FIFA obviously and we have recommendations about representation. What would your ideal recommendation be coming out of the task force in terms of athletes representation, footballers representation in the running of FIFA? Um, what would be the ideal recommendation that you would see? Do you see it as appropriate for there to be an individual on some sort of future executive committee of FIFA? And I could, if I could even extend the question, it may be beyond your expertise, but I would be interested in your opinion, because it's something we're grappling with about support for representation. What would be the adequate, to both of you, and proportionate representations of independent supporters groups? in the running of international sports organizations. Thank you. I think uh, we, can, we have sufficient time so we can take one question at a time. Very good question. Um, um, let me say that, yeah, so 34 international sports federations have some form of uh, at least representation, so they grant some form of consultative status to uh, athletes, of course there is large diversity between uh, between the federations um, on the subject of well, how far do they go in, in, in granting athletes a voice. Um, so as I said before, uh, we see that in only um, eight federations there is a kind of a connection between the athletes and those that are represented um, at, uh, in the board. But you raised a very important question there. Um, 
Of course, it's not sufficient only to have an ethics committee. We have to look into what they are doing. And that's one of the weaknesses, I would say, of the Sports Governance Observer, is that it was completely impossible for me to determine <coughs> what is this committee doing. Um, it's difficult to get that from statutes, rules, and those remain the base, uh, those were uh, like the basic sources of data, yeah? looking into the rules. and. Uh, 15 federations assisted me into offering more comprehensive information and additional information on their organization. Uh, but if we are to develop this sports governance observer, this is one of the key points. We need to adjust better. What are these committees doing? What should they be doing? Um, so definitely, yes. Second thing, supporter involvement. Um, I think the big, biggest problem there, I mean, sports... Let me, no, let, me, let me start again. Supporters are, they have an incredibly, they have an incredible potential to change sports governance because without supporters, you do not have su professional support. Everything collapses without supporters. Why do they not um, capitalize on this potential? That's because it's extremely difficult to organize them. And only I mean, good attempts have been made in the past few years to, to kind of try to organize them. I would not say that this has crystallized uh, to the extent that um, there is a strong uh, group representing supporters and where uh, supporters really feel connected to, uh, to this group. Um, so I would say that firstly we need to do something about that. We need to establish uh, representative groups that really have a connection uh, with supporters uh, that can function at the international level. At the national level, there are some, uh, definitely in, uh, in the UK, there are some powerful groups, but we need to have that at the international level. Only when we have that, um, we can start about uh, thinking about how can we involve them better. There needs to be a good connection. In terms of the role of the players in the International Federation, um, as I said, the key principle is one of accountability. Um, I think that's the most important principle. As athletes, we want the International Sporting Federations to have the best governance model. And I think that you cannot argue against independence in, 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 in the executive committee or the board operating strategically. Therefore, as athletes, we, we should respect that and we will benefit from that because an independent governance framework will deliver the best outcomes for the sport. So I think the best role for the athletes is to have a very strong position within the decision-making process that appoints and, and elects and removes the board and that the athletes should have a substantial say, not for example, that I see that we'd be one of 206 members in the FIFA Congress, or that we would be one of 12 in a club-based structure, we should have a stake that is commensurate with the fact that we generate all the revenue. <laughs> so our stake should uh, be close to being uh, equal of any other stakeholder, because the sport exists for the athletes. But of course, in order to provide that level of accountability, the sports are entitled to say, well, how are we satisfied that the athletes themselves are well governed? And, you know, for example, at FIFA Pro, I'll just give you some insight. FIFA Pro has uh, around 60 members. We have in place uh, what we call the membership development and accountability system. That assesses all of our members for their performance in 10 key areas that we identify which is critical to the way a players association should be run. The president of FIFA Pro is nominated by the board and has to then be ratified by the Congress so that President has the confidence of both major stakeholder groups there. And furthermore, is subject to two-term limit. So we're doing whatever we can to ensure that there's good governance within FIFA. But I think that the best role within the International Sporting Federation is a high level of accountability. Now, how are you going to deliver that accountability? I'm leaning a lot towards political accountability for the reasons I've just mentioned. The alternative is industrial accountability. And I think we're going to have turbulent years ahead. I think the litigation that I've mentioned means the next few years there'll be a lot. Athletes aren't putting up with this stuff anymore. So we're going to have a turbulent period. But I, if you look at the United States, 
without political accountability, where do you end? You end with a collective bargaining agreement expiring and there being a strike or a lockout. Now, I would argue that at the international level, if there was a political accountability, then that incredibly acrimonious disputation could be avoided. So I think uh, the best structure is political accountability and a commitment to social dialogue. Now, that may sound like self-interest from an athlete's representative, but I think history proves that if the athletes have confidence in the processes, then they're the first line in defending sport against threats to its integrity. It amazes me how often we're excluded from discussions with WADA and with other bodies when we're the ones speaking to the players all the time. You know, when, when our athletes' unions sit down and collectively bargain, there are tens of players in the room. <laughs> the athletes are very heavily involved in all of the decision-making processes. These are not organisations which are distant from the athletes. So uh, I think that combination of political accountability and uh, an industrial framework would, would, would deliver the best outcomes. In relation to the fans, I agree with Arna. The problem is uh, they're not organised. And then you'll get strong lobby groups that, that, that will not necessarily be representative of all the fans. And I like to come to an international stage and even though my accent gives me away, not talk about Australia. Um, but, and I don't even, uh, and I, my background as you know is football or soccer as we say in Australia. But the Australian Football League, in a country of 22 million, um, has one million members of their clubs. And it prohibits private ownership. So uh, the club I support, called Richmond, has 70,000 members. And they appoint and elect the board. And every club in the competition is structured that way. And the competition's actually run on a not-for-profit basis. So there are models there, but they have to be holistic models. Now, how could you? Know, I would argue that the English Premier League does not need private ownership. There's enough revenue in English football that the sport could be viable without capital investment. But of course, to change that now is uh, is, is 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 too difficult. And the NFL actually prohibits public ownership apart from one team. So you know, unless you could get such a, a across the board model that the AFL has, which is almost unique then I think the problem you would have with fans groups, and we support it as a matter of principle, we work very closely with the organised fan groups, so we, we welcome their input, but they need to do what we need to do. It's like if you want to be a union and you want to be heard, you have to speak for 100% of the players, and the fan groups have the same obligation. If they can deliver on that, that they're speaking for nearly all of the fans, then of course we should involve them. Maybe can I just, as a quick follow-up, maybe a... Uh, maybe a little bit of a naughty question. Do you have this, the feeling that the athlete representative organizations, the athlete unions, that they are speaking for all the athletes? Yes and no. Yeah, there's over 100 unions and some are poor and some are great. You know, some are unbelievable. So we have to be honest on that. And um, you know, Developing a players association is difficult work. Um, but we are necessarily transparent, not-for-profit, open organisations, so that, that can be assessed. And also this collective bargaining process, the social dialogue process is difficult. You know, the international sporting federations have a lot of power in that negotiation. So that unless the association is very well organised, the players association is very well organised, then you won't get the quality of outcomes that you want. That'll, that'll come through um, um, in the table. But, Part of the objective of Union World Athletes is, you know, sure, we want to advance matters of common concern, but another aspect is to advance best practice in the, uh, in the administration of player associations, and that's why we're delighted to have the big US unions uh, as part of the process, because there is definitely a, a, a wide <coughs> level of uh, performance in, in the quality of the associations. Okay, other questions? I'm Ursula Terakiewicz from Warsaw University. And uh, my question is a little bit beyond this session, maybe more to the previous session, but also to this session, so, so that's why I ask. Um, I think that our bigger, biggest problem uh, in sports in the uh, International Sports Federation is the monopoly of those organizations. And we all say, say that, yes, we do have to have one um, organization that is very strong, but 
I know that it's a revolutionary idea, but actually why do we have this monopole uh, organization on the international level? Even if we look at those um, uh, unions, of, of, uh, as you represent um, the players' unions, if the unions compete between the others, then the players uh, choose the union that really represents them. And then the union is better and the governance is better because if the union gets, you know, is just for the players, then, then uh, just for the itself, not the players, then the, the players will just switch to the other union. And uh, we don't have that. We have just one federation, and uh, Jens just on the, the previous session said that we can ruin the FIFA and build a new one, but why don't we have uh, more than one federation on uh, each sport and then? Maybe the uh, co just competing between those uh, federations could be a good idea for for the better governance. Um, maybe if I can answer first. Um, look, if international sports federations do not improve their governance, maybe they will end up in situations such as that that they are no longer uh, they no longer have a monopoly. Monopoly is very attractive. Uh, in, uh, in sports governance, I think. Um, you need one set of rules to organize international competition. It would be very difficult to have, um, for instance, diff different uh, international football federations and still organize uh, World Cup. So whose organization's rules are you going to follow? So that's, that's of course, um, that's a bit difficult, I think. But it's an interesting idea. Um, I do believe that it's better to have uh, monopolies uh, to challenge the many uh, governance, um, well, to tackle the many governance challenges that face international sports today. I, I think that's, that's perhaps, uh, it's a better idea to have monopolies, but it's a very interesting suggestion. I don't know what that is. Well, I think the reason we like monopolies in sport is largely emotional. You know, um, we like to know that uh, Germany's won the World Cup on four occasions, and there's badges on the shirt, and that, that's very symbolic and very meaningful. If you look at a sport like boxing, uh, I think you see, and boxing's had a lot of challenges, but uh, you know, when I was a kid, the heavyweight champion of the world was almost the most famous athlete in the world, and then that has had a lot of competition. There's been more economic activity. Whether boxing is stronger or weaker as a consequence is probably a personal, personal view. The National Football League, the biggest sport in the United States, you know, had competition between two leagues. Major League Baseball had competition between the American League and the National League. So clearly there's room for competition. It, it, it would largely have uh, an adverse emotional consequence um, for people. Rugby League is a breakaway from rugby union. Um, you know, there are many examples of competition in sport over the years. But I think we have to ask ourselves, how do you deliver competition against the monopoly? That's what Claudia Peckstein's trying to do. All she wants is a fair hearing. <laughs> she can't get it. It's when sport overreaches. Um, now sport is to say, it, it just has this control obsession. It's, it's an extreme example of a monopoly. And that rule I quoted on the Athletes Commission is classic. Hey, yeah, you, we will let you be heard, but you do what we say. It's, it's an extraordinary obsession that tends to go with a lot of the people that rise to the top of international sports federations, this fear of accountability. And I think that if all of a sudden that accountability was there, and as soon as there was any hint of self-interest or poor decision-making, that executive committee members could be removed, then we would at least start to introduce some competition into the decision-making process um, which, which which isn't there at the moment. <coughs> okay. uh, so, Roland Jack from I Trust Sport. One of the big issues in international sport now is the calendar. It's got very complicated. Some sports, the athletes compete too much, <coughs> maybe because the organisers are trying to squeeze every last you know, dollar, euro, franc out of the competition. But it seems to be the conflicts both between sports and within sports about the calendar. Um, who do you think should legislate for the international calendar of sport? If you've got the IOC and all the multiple sports bodies and federations, I can see lots of conflicts of interest. It's very difficult to get right. 
Who should legislate? What do you mean? Uh, who should be responsible for putting together the calendar of sport? Yeah. That's an interesting question. What I would just like to say briefly, I'm, I'm going to give uh, you uh, the floor um, to answer that more elaborately, but briefly, what is important is that you involve those that are actually competing, of course, those that are have, those that have to play the games, um, and those that are that, that's athletes, but also clubs. Huh? Huh? So I think in the decision, uh, decisions relating to uh, the match calendar, that's uh, an excellent uh, topic for a social dialogue between clubs and players, and they should be the ones that are primarily involved in this decision and who actually legislates and implements it. That's something else, but it's about who has a say in these rules more than who is implementing it, I think. It also goes to the monopoly point, you know, um, how, how do international sporting federations operate? It's quite simple. They introduce a compulsory rule that the clubs have to release the players. So the clubs pay the players, international sporting federations make four or five billion dollars without having to pay the players. That's a great deal. <laughs> how good's that one? Now how is that changed for a European Clubs Association? European Clubs Association entered into an extraordinary agreement with UEFA. It has a clause in it that says, the European Clubs Association, and UEFA acknowledges this, only recognises FIFA as the governing body of football if there's an agreement in place regarding compensation for the release of the players for the international matches. So there, the ECA, and they've litigated on this point, had the sense to challenge the club country release provisions as being anti-competitive. And you can imagine all sorts of problems, it's interfering with contracts, there's a whole lot of legal problems associated with that, but they challenged the monopoly. From an athlete's perspective, it's a huge issue. Why is Lionel Messi, and I use his name absolutely hypothetically, why will he dope, for example? The reason, and I shouldn't name any athlete, but the reason an athlete like that will dope is normally as follows. He's playing 60, 70 games a year. He completely trusts the medical advisors of his club and or his country. And he's played on Wednesday in, uh, he's played on Sunday in Barcelona, plays on Wednesday in Buenos Aires, and then plays on Sunday in Seville. And he needs to recover from the matches. And his medical people tell him, these are the supplements, this is the care, this is what will enable you to make, make this extraordinary workload. And he acts in good faith. And this is the whole point of the um, SMM case in Australia, which you may have heard about. The acting, the players acting in uh, on the advice of their clubs. Yet the water code doesn't take that into account. Why should, an, why should a worker, an employee, lose their career because they listen to the direction of their employer who has a duty of care to them. And again, the view is strict liability, very simplistic, throw out, you know, we've got to be tough on drugs in sport, and it just does not take into account the complexity of these issues. The, uh, Packer X said this is complex, <laughs> right? This is complex for athletes. The best way to do it is to have the athletes at the table working through these issues. Baseball had a steroids problem. They sat down with the Players Association and they dealt with it. And I think that shows the good faith that the athletes unions have on these, these types of issues. If I may add just one thing, you mentioned the European Club Association. Uh, it's interesting to note that the European Club Association has made, I would say, historical uh, memorandums of understanding just recently with uh, UEFA and uh, with FIFA on uh, players release uh, on uh, the international match calendar and there you see that European Club Association, representative organization of the biggest of, of European clubs, they negotiate directly with UEFA, directly with FIFA, but not with players. And this is just how the power structures are in football today. It's European Club Association negotiating with FIFA, European Association negotiating with uh, UEFA. It would be very interesting to see uh, European Club Association negotiating with players' associations on, uh, on the international match calendar because yeah, they are really left out of this uh, discussion, I think. Just quickly say, because uh, Frederick Guinier is here, he's the Director of International Relations at FIFPRO. We're in discussions now with the European Clubs Association, but it's really probably taken the complaint <laughs> to the European Commission to, to, to get that to happen on the transfer system. We'll see what happens.
a long, long, long way to go. But in the absence of that legal proceeding, mm -hmm. I think um, it's, it's very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. But the European Clubs Association litigated too, to mm -hmm. get its hearing as well. Yeah. And that shows that you can use the European Union as a control mechanism against uh, monopolies of international sports federations. Um, thank you. I think we're out of time. Thank you all very much for your attention, for your very interesting questions, and uh, see you later.